So welcome back, everybody, to the very last class of the semester. I'm glad you found some time in between debugging uh, your final projects to come listen to Kathy Yellick, who I believe you've heard before this semester, who's the Associate Lab Director at LBL, talk about the future of not just big machines, but big data. Thanks very much, Jim. So um, yeah, I'm going to talk about big data, uh, big iron, that is big computers, and the future of high-performance computing. So I have a lot of material. I kind of put a couple of talks together here um, to talk about some of the things that I've been doing. And I've been spending, I spent a fair amount of time, as Jim can attest, in Washington um, talking to policymakers there. So I'm happy to comment on that as well. Um, it's a small group, at least here in the room. So I do encourage people to um, just raise your hand, and I will be happy to ask questions or um, give you opinions about things or whatever. But but, um, and I do talk fast, so um, I, and I hope you're used to that from the semester of listening to Jim lecture as well. But um, that doesn't mean that I wouldn't be happy to take a question. So big data. Um, it's a word that is bandied about in the newspaper every day. Um, at basically, you can't go on the web without seeing something about big data. It changes everything around us. It changes what you buy, right? That you buy beer when you buy diapers because they put them together in the store. Um, that you, it changes the way we run our, um, our uh, athletic teams. And it changes the way, the kinds of things we grow and how farmers uh, operate and the way these uh, corporations now run um, agriculture. So I think I may have talked about this the last time, but um, I am the associate lab director at Berkeley Lab, as Jim said. And um, just to give you a little bit of context, uh, what I what have been trying to do for the last year or two is try to figure out, well, what does big data mean in science? And specifically, what does it mean to the kind of science that we do within the Department of Energy and with the lab like um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab? So you have to understand a little bit about the lab to understand my perspective on this. Um, and so we like to think of Berkeley Lab as helping to define the idea of big team science. That is re running really big experiments, building big experiments, um, and getting a whole team of people together to work on science. Um, Lawrence Berkeley Lab is the oldest of the national labs, founded in 1931. Lots of Nobel Prizes and other kinds of uh, statistics here, but the picture here that we show is about um, E.O. Lawrence down here at the bottom, sitting with him, here with his entire team of scientists, including some famous people like Oppenheimer and so on up there um, in the top row. But he thought of his team, which included his um, administrative support and his engineers, as all part of what got him his Nobel Prize. And he talks about that in his Nobel acceptance speech. speech. So it's really about doing big collaborative science of a kind that I will say, um, it, although every university that you talk to will talk about interdisciplinary research and the importance of that, and this class is exactly training you to do that kind of research, it is difficult in a university environment to sometimes build those connections to figure out how to get tenure in a, in a situation where you're uh, trying to work on somebody else's science problem in addition to a uh, science area in addition to your own. But the lab is really set up to work on those kinds of problems. The other thing that you should know about the Department of Energy and Lawrence Berkeley Lab, among all the other DOE labs, is we run big, huge user facilities. So this includes things like the Advanced Light Source, um, which is a building up there. You're seeing kind of a, a, an image of the inside of it um, superimposed over the uh, image of the outside of it. Uh, the Joint Genome Institute, which does all of the genomics um, analysis sequencing for the Department of Energy. The Molecular Foundry. Um, we run, of course, the Supercomputing Center that you've been using in this class, and the Energy Sciences Network, ESNet. So lots of big facilities. We have about um, uh, 10,000 visitors that come physically to the lab to use these scientific facilities, um, including things like the Molecular Foundry and NSEM and JGI and the Light Source. Now, they don't come to use ESNet because that connects the lab complex together and connects it to the internet. Um, and uh, they also don't physically come and use NURSE because for the most part, other than coming sometimes for training sessions, which by the way, I um, encourage you all to take advantage of. If we have one of these, uh, we, will, we will be, um, for example, having training sessions on future architectures and how to use them. Um, that, that um, and you've heard from some of the other people in NERSC. Uh, for the most part, um, they, f people don't physically come to use those two kind of computing technologies, but from every place out, uh, the other facilities, they physically come today um, and they bring their sample and they run it through the advanced light source. And I'll say a little bit more about that. But that's the kind of thing that we do at the lab. So the question is, well, what does this mean, uh, kind of given this context, this piece of the scientific um, ecosystem, how does big data affect us, if at all? 
So I did a really kind of silly experiment, and I said, well, um, one of the things that we have is some great results on neutrinos. Um, we, we work actually in our computing center with um, the Dia Bay project, which is in China, where they, um, they made a discovery about the, one of the last uh, kind of unknowns about the neutrino mixing angle, the theta 1, 3. Don't ask me more about it. That's the kind of the depth of which I can tell you about um, this neutrino result. But uh, here's a little picture from uh, neutrino, this, this experiment, and I put it into Google image search and said, what will I get out of this? And the answer is I get out a bunch of graphs that have nothing at all to do with neutrinos. Um, and have colors on them that look kind of like the graph of neutrinos. Now, I can do a better search, of course. I can stick in the word neutrino, and that's going to help a little bit. And I might see some graphs that are more relevant to my science problem. But this is very different than what I do when I'm shopping at home. If I'm looking for a, you know, a blue blouse and you put that in, you're going to get a whole bunch of blue blouses. And you can say, oh, I want one that looks kind of like that. And you'll get a bunch of other products that look just kind of like that. So science is not like that right now. right? Science is, um, you can go to the publications. You can go to Google Scholar. And you can find the people who are working on neutrinos, and you can call them up, and you can ask them or send them email and say, can you send me your data? But it's not like you can just go and get that. So how does the scientific workflow work today at one of these user facilities like the Advanced Light Source? So here's our little tiny picture of the Advanced Light Source. It's actually that little ring up there. It's a big, huge um, photon storage ring. There are about 40 beam lines around the outside of the, that. Each of those is a different experimental kind of end station where scientists come in, and, and there's, a, there's a beam line scientist who's an expert on how to use that little piece of the technology. Um, there's ones for biology. There are ones for um, developing new chips, um, people that you, you, know, you look at uh, lithography and things like that for um, computer chip design that's run by Semitech. So there's all these different beam lines for different kinds of experiments. And they come in and they, they use that experiment. So the beam line user shows up. They fly into Berkeley. They go stay at the, the uh, new guest house up there on the hill. Uh, they bring in their memory stick. They run their experiment. Hopefully, they store their data on their memory stick. We've heard the reports that sometimes they can't get the data off of the uh, device fast enough, and so they miss their plane. But hopefully, they make their plane. Uh, their data isn't too big. They fly back home uh, to their home institution. They think really hard. They write a publication. And then the, da the data gets thrown away. Now, they don't always throw away their data explicitly. Um, and uh, I like to, to tell a story about when I was an assistant professor here many years ago. And, um, after I'd been here for about a year, my office was just a mess. It had piles of paper of stuff, blue memos from the university and other kinds of paper that people had sent me and this and the other thing. And this much more senior uh, faculty member, Beresford Parlett, um, came, was in my office. And I said, what do you do about all this paper? I mean, he'd been there for many years. I, you know, it just seems like I was going to have to move out of my own office. And he said, well, he figures that when you get a memo from a piece of paper from somebody, you can make one of two decisions. Either you can file it, in which case you'll probably never remember where you put it, and it's basically gone forever. Forever, or you can throw it away, in which case it is gone forever. So you might as well just throw it away. And the point with these scientists is that they're not actively trying to throw away their data, but they may never be able to find it again. And certainly no other scientist will ever be able to find their memory stick again. Um, there's a great article actually in Science about someone who tried, a, a team that tried to go back and, and look at um, data from one of these big scientific experiments uh, 10 years after the experimental facility was shut down. Um, and what they had to do is they had graduate students who would look over all the graphs on the publications that had been written at the time and try to read their numbers off of those graphs and put them in. They had other students who were going through old files and trying to find the data. Um, and they used this data to write uh, papers that were then so cited by the Nobel Committee as high quality research. So um, from the new results that they went back and reanalyzed, because they had a different perspective on what the data should, how they should think about the data. So we really don't want this model of how science is done. Um, well, one of the other comments I've heard is that we apparently image a lot of cockroaches in the um, things like the advanced light source or in the bioimaging facilities. We don't need to do that over and over again, right? If, the, if somebody had access to the bioimaging data from the first experiment, then um, other people could just look at it. So um, what's our new model of how this works? Well, um, the idea is that the data that, that is being um, used in the experimental system is it being uh, collected from the experimental facility. Um, actually flows over ESNet, the network, into a computing or scientific data facility, if you will, um, like NERSC, and it's stored there and it can be computed. In some cases, there will be computation that happens in real time. That's actually a picture of this science gateway right here, which is a web portal, so the scientists can see their data. And this is actually um, supposed to be a little movie, which I think isn't working, of a, of a, a little insect here that is um, 
that will move around and, and is being imaged inside of there. Um, and you can you have simulation and data analysis inside of this science gateway, this, this web portal, um, where the compu computing on that data is happening kind of behind the scenes um, on the NERS systems. And so you've got your Beamline user, and in fact this was just um, just tested about two weeks ago um, with this thing. This is called the Spot Suite, um, which is this web portal s tied with these analysis tools um, and imaging tools for looking at things that are happening in one of the beam lines. It's just one of the 40 experiments um, at the ALS. And um, what the scientist who was actually in Europe um, did was he was on a train and he had, first of all, shipped his samples, I think there were about 100 samples, to the ALS. Um, there were robots at the ALS that had been installed on one of the beam lines, so the samples are now being put through the ALS, um, ex this experimental device um, with robots. Um, he was sitting there on the train in uh, Europe uh, on his iPhone, was able to look at the images, and he said that he was able to do his science just, just as well as if he had been physically located here. So it's a kind of a new model of how science is being done. And of course, the other advantage of this is many other people could look at the data. Once the data is shared and serve, it can be served um, to the user community, uh, people that are in small institutions that don't have access to or never get time on the beam lines can and also go back and analyze that data in different, way, different ways. It sort of democratizes science and it also has the potential to improve the quality of science because a lot of people are looking at um, your data and can reanalyze it in different ways. It can be a little bit threatening to scientists, but um, probably it has uh, an overall benefit to science. Okay, so um, uh, I, I'm going to talk about my vision of the future for science. I call this uh, the 2031 Science Odyssey. So what does a life of a scientist look like um, in 2031? Well, first of all, there are no departmental um, or personal computers. You probably have your devices, your handheld devices and so on that you use to access your experimental data, um, exactly how you're going to be typing. Uh, well, you know, we're still working on that technology, but the kind of systems that we run um, for individual departments and so on, and, or the old style of personal computers that would sit in your office no longer exist. Um, users don't log into the high performance computing facilities in this class when you're using systems at NERSC. The idea is you get an account, you write some code, you write your matrix multiplier, whatever, um, you write some scientific application, you run that, um, you, you collect the data from it, you write your paper, whether it's a, a computer science paper or a, uh, you know, or a biology or physics or chemistry paper, and then nobody else sees those results, right? You see the results of your simulations and, and nobody else necessarily sees them. But that's not the model um, of the future. You probably don't log Again, Christine Pearson, I know, was here, I think, on Tuesday, and she talked about this model of having a different kind of a gateway, which is a gateway to this materials um, genome data, and in that case, the difference between putting in a query that looks something up in a database and putting in a query that causes um, 100 or 1,000 simulations to be run is only a matter of how long it takes for that query to respond. So it's no longer a user kind of logging in and running jobs. It's basically computer uh, bots, if you will, that are running the jobs on your behalf. So we're having to think about what this means at NERSC if um, we have all of these people who are kind of virtual users of NERSC but are no longer logging in and we don't really track them the way we do um, individual users right now. You know, I could have just sent my bot down the hill um, to, to give this lecture um, rather than coming in person. Uh, you know, we would just have a few, few people that give, that give lectures to millions of students at a time. Uh, if that's not controversial enough, the idea that you maybe prove theorems, you do mathematics um, with online communities, and this already happens today in certain examples where, once again, it allows uh, people who would normally not be involved in those discussions to get involved. Laboratory work is outsourced. So this is a, was a surprise to me. I mean, I think the computing idea is you can see a little bit more why um, already people don't physically come to nurse to use the supercomputers. Um, but there's a, um, a, a researcher who does medical research at Stanford, and he was talking about the fact that you can, you can go and buy um, a set of mice, for example, and you can say, you can, you can outsource them to a lab, and you say, I want 100 mice, run this particular experiment. So give them this drug and send me the results and tell me what happens. Um, and if you don't trust one laboratory, um, you can go and hire three laboratories and then kind of vote on the results and make sure the, votes, the, the data is consistent across the three different laboratories. So the whole idea of what it means to be a scientist is kind of changing when you, um, the person that is uh, running the simulations, for example, is not necessarily the same person as the one who's analyzing the results, the one who's doing the lab work. That lab work may be, be used by a lot of other people. So it's, uh, it, you know, the world is changing um, in interesting ways in terms of the way science is being done. These experimental facilities, I already gave you the example of this where the advanced light source will be used remotely. 
Um, this was very threatening, by the way, to the lab people who are used to having these 10,000 users come in every year. And they said, well, how will we count them? How will we know who they are? How will we you know, get credit for the fact that we've helped them? And um, so it is, uh, it is a um, kind of you know, another thing that, that's changing in the dynamics. Um, and as, all the scientific data is eventually open. This is something that um, you know, Obama had, has a data initiative. Um, and there is a directive that says, you know, this data, scientific data that is collected with federally funded um, projects needs to be made public. And this has flowed down through the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy uh, and NIH, where they have different kinds of policies about how the data has to be shared. Um, and people, actually, the agencies are still trying to figure out exactly how to do this and exactly what it means to make the data open. Because it's uh, my w worst fear of this is that. Um, the, the scientists all say, oh, I know what I'll do. I will um, I'll, I'll buy a, web, a little server. We'll set up an Apache web server. Actually, I'll ask one of my graduate students who is, let's say, a physicist to set up an Apache web server. We'll stick all of our data on that, and that will be our, our science data that is served to the world. But of course, nobody can find anything interesting if that's what happens. And uh, plus, it's going to waste a lot of time with a lot of graduate students. So we want a better model of how science should be put together. And as I said before, I think the idea of what it means to do really big science, it's not just a few universities or labs that can do this kind of big science or team science. It can be done um, by many groups that are virtualized across the um, area. So what is, so the, um, the view of this extreme data science is that the scientific process is about to under, undergo a radical transformation based on our ability to, um, to collect data, to analyze data, to simulate, model data, and combine large and complex data sets together. And um, I think I, I left out the picture of the, what the facility looks like in this case, but I do think it's important in many of these scientific areas that you try to bring the data together into a place where um, data across different kinds of science areas or across different institutions and different science groups can be analyzed together because what you'd really like to do is to take Christine Pearson's data from the materials project and the advanced light source data that's looking, that's imaging, for example, or analyzing experimentally what some of these materials look like and put those together to figure out um, you know, whether or not the simulations are, uh, are um, explaining the data that you're seeing and, um, and we'll see, see these kinds of things coming together. So you don't really want to just spread the data all out all over the world. You want to at least bring it together. And of course, that's what companies like um, Google and Amazon and Yahoo do when, uh, I mean, to take Google as an example, I mean, my understanding of what they do is that they, they make copies of your data, right? The fact that you have your own web, web pages um, in your own directory at your own university is fine and that you kind of control what the content of that data is, but they're going to suck all of that data in so they can index it and figure out what points to what and you know how to rank things on a Google search um, so that your web page shows up at a certain point when people ask for a certain kind of science result or whatever. So the things that are really enabling this kind of new science model is, first of all, the growth in data. And I will say a little bit more about that. But roughly speaking, it's coming from the fact that within Department of Energy, and this is the Office of Science I'm talking about, so the completely unclassified part of DOE, um, where we do a lot of science and energy, uh, research and energy and related kind of basic science areas like physics and biology and chemistry. Um, there are particular challenges that come up because of the fact that they run these big scientific user facilities, not just the ones at Berkeley Lab, but every lab around the complex has these kinds of big scientific facilities. It also allows us, I mean, this is kind of our strategy at the lab for dealing with this data, is to focus on the data that's at those user facilities because it's easier to uh, attack that problem and say, what are the kind of data tools, analysis techniques, infrastructure, storage, and so on that we, and computing that we need to have for all the data that's collected at the advanced light source, even though that is already very heterogeneous because each beamline is a little bit different, um, than it is to say, well, how, what about every, res every researcher that's out in the university community? So we're starting with these big user facilities where they have, uh, also because the, the user facilities are sort of a pain point within DOE where they recognize that they have so much data, they don't know what to do with it. One of the um, scientific, the light sources in Japan recently did an upgrade, um, and they have, they have such high data rates that you have to come in with your portable, I believe it is 100 terabyte um, drive, which is not a very portable sort of thing right now. So, um, you know, big data, the, these big uh, so sources of data, uh, they're generating very high volumes and high velocities of data. Um, analysis methods, you know, we, there's a lot of progress that's been made in things like machine learning algorithms and statistics, applied mathematics that help us analyze this data in ways that were not possible 
um, 10 years ago or certainly uh, 20 years ago. Um, and then the fact that um, we're, this scientific process, as I've talked about, is changing the ability to take different kinds of data, that's multimodal analysis, take two different modes of data um, and put them together and to be able to ask different kinds of questions. Now I know that um, Julian Burrell was here to talk about um, a particular kind of cosmology um, and uh, this is a picture of Saul Perlmutter. I don't think he probably talked about Saul's results, is that right? Because Saul works in a pretty... He talked about George Smoot, right? So, so Saul works in a different area, um, and what Saul does, also looking at the expansion of the universe, um, but he's not looking at cosmic microwave background, he's looking at supernova, um, and, and what he's doing is using these exploding stars um, and using them as standard candles to measure the expansion of the universe. So you're trying to figure out how the universe, um, how quickly the universe expands, and in, in particular, uh, then being able to prove that it was an expanding and accelerating rate, um, so the expansion is getting faster. And, he talked about both a little bit. Okay, so so l let's just talk about the, the data problem that um, Saul and, and that line of work has been dealing with. They've been dealing with images. So so Julian is talking about these these measurements of uh, temperature um, and. Uh, but they used to, in the, in the space where they're looking at supernova, they're looking at these images and they're trying to identify where is an exploding star, where is a supernova. Um, and they used to look at gigabytes per night, and they used to man manually analyze that among the scientific community. Then they said, okay, well, we can do better than this. We can filter out the images because some of them clearly have no interesting stuff because the images look exactly like it did the last 30 nights or whatever. So they filtered it out. Then they tried crowdsourcing it. Um, did he talk about, it? They, they crowdsourced it out actually um, around the world. This was not to necessarily to, to ex, um, scientific experts, um, but, but you know, it's not that hard to train people to look for a supernova. Um, in fact, I think some 12-year-old some uh, discovered one and she got her name assigned to it. But um, the, uh, they, what they discovered when they were crowdsourcing it is that the, the quality of supernova detection dropped um, at about 9 p.m. In, in the UK. Anybody know what happens in the UK around 9 p.m.? Are used to tea time close and and the bars were closing so the bars close everybody goes home and they say oh I might as well look for some supernova tonight um, and uh, so then they weren't they weren't so good at it um, at that particular point in time so they could actually see perturbation in the data set. Then they got machine learning algorithms, and the machine learning algorithms, this little graph shows machine learning is better, not just than the people in the UK or who had been drinking or whatever, but then the, the scientific experts were at, um, at identifying these. So they now use these automatic classification algorithms. And now they're trying to, to do what, um, what, what Peter Nugent will call systematics, which is the basic problem. They've kind of got the statistics problem solved, that is figuring out what looks like a supernova and what doesn't. The problem is that a telescope that's in the northern hemisphere is going to have a certain bias in what it's looking at. And when you're trying to figure out things like what is the computational, the cosmological constant in the universe, um, you really need to get these biases out of the instruments. And so they want to take you know, data from the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere and put them together and figure out how they fit together um, and kind of to remove those biases. So they're looking at graphical models um, in order to do that kind of analysis. So um, just sort of one computer science um, uh, result from, from NERSE. So Peter Nugent um, uh, made a discovery of one of the, um, with, with some other people, of the young, one of the youngest nearby supernovae. And um, he, then this is in this, was announced in this, this nature thing. It's a little tiny dot here, which is hard to see. Um, but uh, it was actually one that was close enough that you could see it with binoculars at night um, in this, the area. And, um, uh, but how did he do that? Well, it turned out that we had just done an upgrade of the file system at NERSC. Um, and the file system was running much faster than it had been. This was a couple of years ago. And um, so he was uh, sitting there one night. And in fact, he was trying to submit jobs. I believe it was into Hopper. And Hopper wasn't behaving so well at that point. So he said, well, I can't look at Hopper. Maybe I'll go back and look at this data. And there had been all this data that had been filtered and, and classified um, using these algorithms because the file system was so much uh, faster that all this data had sort of piled up and was waiting for a human to look at the results of it. So he looked at this and he noticed this thing that looked like a supernova and it turned out um, that it was in within 11 hours of, of ignition of when it started to explode. Now, of course, it was 10 million light years away, so it was actually 10 million years and 11 hours ago that it started to explode. But they were able to capture this and they redirected telescopes worldwide um, to, to um, uh, capture images of this, this which was uh, never seen before kind of results. Okay.
What are some of the other problems from a computational, computer science, or mathematical standpoint that come up in this big data? This is looking at something called the Tika Toolkit. Um, Michael Weiner came and talked about climate modeling, so he may have mentioned this. But the basic problem is you know, you're looking for things like how many cyclones were there in a 100-year simulation of the, of the climate model. And the, these little purple lines were these, um, all these different cyclones that were detected automatically. I'm using pattern matching. Right now, they're really using pattern matching. They want to use more pattern detection going forward, so trying to kind of automatically infer what's an interesting data point. Now, the next example, one of the big challenges in this data problem, and, and the one that actually most of the scientists will tell you is, is the biggest practical issue they deal with, is cleaning up the data. Because a lot of this, um, this data, especially observational data, is, um, is very noisy and um, it has a lot of errors in it. And so this is an example from some data that Deb Agarwal at the lab um, manages called, um, which is carbon flux data from these sensors. And so there's sensors all around uh, the world that are collecting information about how, how much carbon there is. Um, and so she has to clean up the data. Um, and one of the, one of the specific things that they're looking for is spikes in the data that come from bird droppings that drop on the sensors and then cause a spike, which is not, uh, not from the actual uh, car change in the carbon. And so they, they kind of clean up the data um, by going through and removing these spikes. So um, now, Julian probably talked about a different kind of uh, example of pigeon droppings. And of course, uh, these uh, Arne, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, who he talked about, um, they had sort of a similar problem. They had these pigeon droppings, and they kept trying to clean them out. The, the, the le and, and of course, it turned out that it wasn't the pigeon droppings. It was actually the cosmic microwave background that they were seeing. So the lesson of this, this story, the moral here, is be careful when you clean up your data, because you could be throwing out your scientific result. And in fact, um, there's another story of this happening with the ozone hole. When the ozone hole was expanding, then some scientist observed this, and he called NASA, and NASA said, no, no. An ozone hole is not getting any bigger, and the scientists kept insisting, and eventually convinced NASA to go back and look at the raw data that was stored in their tape archive. And they said, sure enough, they had actually been throwing that data out that showed that the ozone hole was increasing because it didn't fit their model of what good data looked like. And so they were missing the fact that there was actually this significant scientific change. Now, the materials project um, that Christine talked about is also an example of one that's generating lots of data. It's kind of you know, changing the way we think about um, collecting data. We'd like to uh, you know, be able to do more machine learning algorithms and things like that to understand um, the functional behavior of these materials and how you can kind of engineer a material to have a certain kind of a property. Um, she talked about that. We're looking at brain imaging. This is an example of multimodal analysis because there's all of these different ways that you can image the brain um, using different kinds of devices, fMRIs and, and things like this. And um, what's the problem? Well, the problem that the, the doctors that we're working with at UCSF have is they're trying to um, detect uh, normal people, which are on the green line. So this is, alas, our cognitive ability over time of a human being. And you can tell it's just a little cartoon here. Um, and the red line is somebody who has, say, Alzheimer's disease. And the problem is that right now, um, you wait until you see certain kind of uh, characteristics, behavior, or whatever, of an individual, which means they've dropped below that, that um, horizontal line there. And at that point, it's very difficult to actually reverse um, that, the, um, the, the condition. So if they could detect which line you're on much sooner, I think they can, have a, they can do a much job, better job of treating it. So they're trying to um, figure out kind of how to detect these things when, before there's any uh, um, obvious observations um, by doing different kinds of brain imaging. Um, and they're trying to put these different data sets together and also figure out um, what the different functional areas of the brain are. So it turns out um, that you take these different things and you kind of try to hook them together and you end up with a sparse matrix. And this is a visualization tool that's been built where you can look at a matrix and kind of select a different region of the uh, brain to look at. Um, but you really, what you're really doing is taking, building this big graph. And they're not quite sure exactly what graph to build, but that's one of the things they're doing research on um, at the lab is to, to try to figure out how you connect together these different kinds of images and the different components of the images, the features of the images, if you will, um, and try to figure out where those things are, are reflecting uh, the same kind of functional behavior in the brain. So what does this graph look like? Um, well, there's a kind of a little tiny piece of it, which is a sparse matrix. But uh, one of these big, big things looks like a big hairball, which is pretty typical of one of these very large data sets that's very unstructured because the relationship between those things is unknown. And so, um, so these are very hard computational problems to try to figure out how to partition up this data. Jim talked about graph partitioning and things like that. 
that's one of the things that you want to do on this kind of a, uh, of a hairball, um, but it's, it's very expensive to compute on it because it's so irregular. And if you could partition it, you could do a better job of computing on it, right? You could reduce the amount of communication that's required to run around on that graph, but the problem is that that's exactly the problem you're trying to solve, so it's no fair to say, first I'll partition your graph, and then I will quickly be able to tell, answer questions like, how can I partition the graph? Okay, so science data is big and it's growing. Um, there are examples from across the science disciplines, at least, that we worry about in the Department of Energy. So we worry a lot about climate modeling, material science, cosmology, I've talked about biology. Um, uh, we, we, by the way, don't do human genomics, although we were, the lab was actually involved in the, in the sequencing, of the, the first sequencing of the human genome at the Joint Genome Institute. Most of our biology data sets are for things like um, plants, fungus, microbiomes, soil, things like that, where um, you're looking at things that, by the way, have no privacy issues associated with them. So that's one of the big data problems that we don't deal with um, for the most part in the Office of Science is anything that has, uh, a lot of people when they talk about big data, they immediately talk about privacy because if you're talking about collecting data about people, um, that, that problem comes up immediately. So I put together a little notional graph to show why these data rates are growing and why it's a problem for computing. Um, so the kind of detectors that are in things like um, light sources, um, the Large Hadron Collider, telescopes and things like that are based on a technology called CCDs. That CCD technology is still is growing um, exponentially. It actually has a couple of factors, both the rate at which you can collect data and also the density of the pixels, if you will, on those things. Um, there's genome sequencers. We thought that was kind of leveling off. It had been going up really quickly for a while. Um, but then Illumina just announced this year um, a new sequencer that can sequence um, the human genome in, in $1,000. Um, the, the metric there is actually the uh, dollars per genome. You have to do a lot of them. You have to be running the sequencer kind of flat out um, all the time to get that kind of a price point. Um, but uh, so this, this line is also going to go up again. You know, this, this kind of pathetic lines down here on this um, graph are uh, the computing performance, and that's, that's aggregate processor performance, um, even with taking into account multi-core processors. And then um, you, you might say, well, we don't care about processor performance because these are data problems but we do care about the speed of memory, and the speed of memory, of course, is even slower than the speed of processor growth. Okay, so there are a few myths um, in uh, high-performance computing, and I'm going to kind of switch gears and start to talk a little bit about modeling and simulation, um, but a lot of people will say that, um, you know, computing is the third pillar of science. I don't know if Jim talked about that earlier. I would say simulation was what they were really referring to. Thir simulation is the third pillar of science, um, and now there's this other piece of it, and some people will call it the fourth paradigm. Not sure I completely like that terminology, but this is the way I like to think about it. In kind of before there were computers, science had two, there were two ways you could do science. You could do experimental science or theoretical science, and oftentimes you would do both of them at the same time because you tried to prove your theories were correct. Um, when the theories get to be very complicated, so a simple theory F equals MA, maybe we can just do it with our, you know, pencil and paper, maybe we can do it with a little spreadsheet. Um, we could, you know, we don't need a supercomputer for that. But when our theories are things like um, the set of equations that describe to the best of our ability to model it how the climate is changing, that's a very complicated theory. And in order to actually understand what that theory tells us about what the climate will look like in 100 years, we need to encode it in a computer program and run the simulation and it will tell us what the theory predicts. Um, and so that was really, has been really the focus of what high performance computing has been about. And I would say that that was heavily influenced um, because the Department of Energy was involved in kind of in, in a lot of that work in modeling and simulation. It's been a real strength of the Department of Energy, but it came from the weapons side of DOE, a different side of DOE that the lab, uh, Berkeley lab is not involved with, but Livermore, for example, is, um, and that had to do with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. So when the, you know, there's a decision made, a policy decision made that we will no longer test nuclear weapons, that is, we won't set off any nuclear explosions, then the only option left for understanding how the weapons work and whether they will continue to work and, um, and uh, you know, being able to uh, um, repair them and things like that has to do with simulation. So there was a huge bet made on simulation, which, was a, which is what allowed the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty 
um, to be signed, which is be because people said, well, that's OK. We can live with simulation. Um, and that required very fast computers, so there was a lot of work in high-performance computing for that. And then the Office of Science, which wasn't involved in weapons, said, hey, we need that for science, too, which is true. There's a lot of really complicated theories and things like material simulation and, and climate change and things you've heard all about that also can require high-performance computing for simulation. The data analysis side, uh, well, in the weapons community, it's sort of a data-poor community, right? They don't, they don't have that much data. Um, and so the ability to analyze that data doesn't necessarily require very sophisticated computing, um, although they do have certain kinds of experiments that they do. But now we see this shifting with the increase in data rates from whoops, things like the sequencers and so on, and, and the uh, CCDs. And so now we have this problem that you need high performance, sophisticated computing on both sides. And by that, I, by the way, I mean not just big, fast computers, but you also need people who understand mathematics and how to get you know, the kinds of things you're using in the, doing in this class, understand how to use those machines effectively. So computing is really important and on both sides of this now, where it used to be more important um, on one side, but because the data sets are larger and more complex, not just larger. Um, so a second myth that I just want to mention in this, this class, and I know you've also had a lecture on cloud computing, right? Um, so you know, a myth, I think, is that Clouds are cheap, supercomputers are expensive. So how does it, where did this myth come from? This myth comes from the idea that a supercomputer, um, Edison is actually not a really expensive supercomputer, but well, let's take one more like Titan. So let's say that's a $100 million supercomputer, order of magnitude. And I think it's a little less than that. But anyway, a $100 million supercomputer, and yet a, a, you know, an hour of computing time in the cloud only costs 10 cents. So we've got 10 cents versus $100 million dollars and clearly a cloud is cheap and a supercomputer is expensive. The problem is, of course, how many hours can you get out of that supercomputer? And so we went and looked at this and, and did an estimate, um, and this was done a few years ago, but at the time we said, well, if we actually tried to buy as much computing as we had at NERSC in the cloud, it would have cost us $900 million. And in fact, um, over a period of about five years I, when I was tracking this more carefully, the, um, the amount of computing that we put at NERSC had gone up by an order of magnitude, and the, the amount of the, the price of buying an hour on Amazon EC2 had dropped by 18%. Okay, so you got a factor of 10 versus 18%. And so my conclusion was uh, Amazon may have been making money at the beginning, but they're definitely making money um, at the end. Part of it is they actually run these cloud services at a much lower level of utilization. You know this as users at NERSC, your jobs sit in the queue, and they sit in the queue because we run those systems at about 95% utilization, which means they're very cheap per hour because they're very heavily utilized. If you go out and, by the way, try to take into account um, how much it costs to buy the storage and the bandwidth of the cloud, the numbers are even higher. So, um, you know, this is, uh, um, this is what it would actually cost to, uh, to, to, let's see, just to buy the time it was $181 million. The nurse budget is, was about uh, 57, you know, a little under 60 million at the time. And, um, the, uh, and, the only, and the fraction of that, we spend about a third of that money, by the way, on hardware. So each year we were spending about $20 million on hardware. Um, so what does the $900 million number come from? That says, well, we did some analysis to say, what if we ran the kind of scientific applications that we run at NERSC, which, by the way, depend on a high-speed network. Um, but we scaled them down. So we said we won't run big, huge applications, because that clearly won't work well in the cloud. We ran them on about 200 nodes or so, and you end up with these sometimes not very large uh, slowdown. So this is BLAST, which was a massively independent, humiliatingly parallel, if you will, um, computation where you're just running lots and lots of versions of the BLAST code for biology. Uh, that runs perfectly well in the cloud. But things that have, like Paratech, which is doing a material simulation, has a big 3D FFT in it, uh, lots of communication slows down by a lot. So. Um, Let's see. So I think this also didn't account for you know all the, the consultants and the people that set up the scientific software. So you don't see that maybe so much in this class, but in addition to the kind of software you use like MPI and say the performance tools and the compilers, um, NERSC also pre-installs for the users things like the cl community climate codes, um, a lot of the material science codes like uh, or chemistry things like VASP. And, um, and others that are, that are popular. And they're, they're kind of optimized by the scientific consultants. So that's something that you wouldn't get in, in at least in EC2. It's more of a software as a service model of cloud computing. So as I said, it's because we run at high utilization. We're a nonprofit organization. And, um, and that was what I had said before about the 10x drop in, uh, in computing out of time. OK, so 
There's, um, there's sort of a debate in the uh, community. Let me skip that particular slide um, and just say, uh, um, there, I hear two things when we talk about data versus simulation. And the two different things I heard actually within a couple of weeks of each other was one person saying, well, the thing about big data applications is they're embarrassingly parallel. There's, you, know, you can run them on any old computer with any old network. That was kind of like the blast problem, right, that I was showing, doing alignment against a reference. You, make, you replicate the reference on all the different nodes. Very little communication is required except to just send the data sets to the nodes. That's really the model that's used also in, in many of the cloud computing applications, very limited communication so that happens in, say, the reduced phase of that. So massive independent jobs for data analysis and for simulations, the kind of stuff that Christine does, although um, she actually does use multiple nodes within her simulations, they're not very large scale. Um, so she actually still needs a better network than that, but still she does run massive numbers of jobs that, that between them are independent. Um, so that's kind of, but that's one type of data analysis application. And the other type is, I, you know, you talk to companies like IBM or Cray and they say, I have a great data machine for you. It's a multi-threaded architecture in which you can run lots and lots of threads for doing graph analytics. So you can have irregular accesses to a big, huge global address space and it'll mask the latency of all those accesses. And, and IBM will say, I'll just, you know, you'll just buy a really big shared memory machine. It's called the Power 7 architecture. It's got more memory bandwidth than you could ever uh, imagine. And it'll, it'll be really good for running these kind of data and analytics problems. So what's the truth here? And in the middle are kind of the things were two really coarse you know, versions of the patterns that we see in scientific simulations, a lot of nearest neighbor computation in terms of the network communication, and some all to all for things like FFTs that come up in those. So what's going on here? Well, in a lot of these data applications, at least the ones that I've looked at um, in any detail, there is a certain amount of massive processing of data. So you're massively processing images, for example. You're extracting features from those images. So they can often be done completely independently of, another, uh, of each other. But then at some point, you're trying to put all those features together to figure out, um, for example, where are there um, supernova? Where are there differences between the images? Um, or in something like genomics, you're looking at, you may be running blasts against a reference, but there's another part of the computation where you're trying to assemble the thing, and that's a very, um, very hard uh, computation to parallelize. So we see some of both of those kinds of things. Okay, so the kind of conclusion from the first part of this talk is hopefully that um, big data is one of the other drivers for high performance computing along with um, the kinds of things you've talked about more in this class, which has been uh, mostly about modeling and simulation sorts of applications. So what about this exascale thing and why are we worried about it? Well, we're worried about it because we want to have faster computers. So here's a, um, a graph I put together with um, not the top 500 list, which um, looks a lot like this. In fact, I'll superimpose it in a minute. But um, these are actually results from what's called the Gordon Bell Prize, um, which is run every year at the Supercomputing Conference in November. And these are actual scientific applications run on the, some of the largest machines in the world. Now, admittedly, sometimes they scale up that problem to one that is um, very, so large that you probably don't run it um, very often, or you may be doing somewhat of a hero run on it. But, um, but still, these are real scientific codes. In fact, Jim was the I think, chair of the Gordon Bell <laughs> Prize Committee more times than he would like to say, so you can ask him about, um, about these. But they're real, real scientific simulations, and you can see the exponential growth. We're trying to get up there to an exascale system for a real computation. Um, and uh, you know what happened in here was uh, very disruptive in the market in the early 90s. There was we used to be using these vector supercomputer machines built by companies like Cray and NEC. Um, and then Attack of the Killer Micros happened, which was basically that the companies like Cray and NEC could not keep up with the processor designers at much bigger companies like Intel and AMD, who had armies of people designing their processors because they had a much bigger market and they could afford to have an army of people designing them and worrying about the technology and things like that. Then, of course, you know, multi-core happened in around 2004, 2005. Uh, the next transition we're looking at, we, we sometimes call attack of the killer cell phones. Actually, this is John Schauf's phrase, and I think he talked earlier in, the, in the, this class as well. This is really about saying the big problem in getting to an exascale is about power. And if it's about power, the, thing, the people that you want to talk to about this are not the people who are designing server processors of the kind that are in the Edison system or 
the, um, or the hopper system today, you want to talk to people who design cell phones because they really understand power constraints. I always assumed that uh, cell phone designers were limited by battery life, and it's true that battery life is a big concern, but cell phone processors, but I, cell phone designer, processor designers, but I was talking to one of them um, who said actually an equally important consideration is, is heat because you really don't like carrying hot cell phones around in your pocket. So um, that's what we're worrying about. And by the way, if I put instead the top 500 numbers on this graph, it changes almost not at all, which just says that at a gross level, when you've got a log scale, the difference between the LINPAC benchmark and these application benchmarks is, um, is not, not really noticeable. Um, you don't want to buy a machine for the LINPAC benchmark. You want to buy a machine to optimize the applications, because at that point, some of the constants, uh, you know, factor of two or so really start to matter. OK, so if energy. Um, is the key to being able to get, do computing. Um, what is the energy problem for something like a supercomputer cent supercomputing center at a place like NERSC? This is something I didn't appreciate before I became NERSC director um, in 2008, but we spend a lot of money on electricity at NERSC. Um, the cost of, uh, run of buying a megawatt of, computing, of, of electricity for a year is about order magnitude a million dollars, a little less. Um, we get we get pretty clean, cheap power at NERSC, but roughly speaking, you should think about it as a million dollars. So um, the hopper system, the older system at NERSC, was, is a, a three megawatt system at one, that was one petaflop. So if you tried to build an exaflop system that's a thousand times faster, um, then um, it would require um, it would require, of course, a gigawatt of power. So that's a billion dollars a year in electricity. We don't have anywhere close to a billion dollars um, in our budget. As I mentioned before, we have got about $60 million in our budget. So, um, so what are we going to do? Well, then, then people said, wait, you've got to take into account Moore's Law. And this was a study I did with a bunch of people in a DARPA study project looking at what, it would, be what would be required to get an exaflop. And people will argue over this exact line. But roughly speaking, the analysis is if you take into account the, the um, power efficiency gains that you get from Moore's Law scaling, that is chip, you know, sh wires becoming shorter, chips becoming denser, um, having more, more uh, computing capability on them, and so on, you still ended up with about a 100 megawatt um, exascale machine. And so that's still $100 million a year, which is still about twice our annual budget. So this is a problem. So right now, the target is to try to get to an exaflop in 20 megawatts. Um, I don't think we're going to hit that. Um, in fact, I believe in Japan right now, they're trying to build a, and I'm trying to remember, it's about a 200 maybe petaflop machine that I think is going to be around 40 megawatts. So, um, so we're getting up there pretty close to that 100 megawatt number. Um, but, uh, uh, but anyway, the goal was, was to get to 20 megawatts. The idea was we, uh, we install about 10 times more power in the building, which is why if you look up Hearst Avenue and you see this building that's being constructed up there at the top of the hill, that's the new computing center, which we, um, we think we could eventually bring in a, a around 50 to 100 megawatts of power. And, um, and then we have to get 100 times more energy efficient. OK, so how do we do that? Um, we use things like cell phone processors, as I said, um, rather than using server processors. This little image just gives you an idea of the size of those processors. So you really get two benefits from it. Um, the cell phone processor runs at only 4 gigaflops, whereas the server processor, this was an Intel Nehalem at the time, was running at 50 gigaflops. Um, but the, uh, so about a factor of 10, one order of magnitude, but two, uh, sorry, three orders of magnitude in the opposite direction in terms of the amount of power they consume. So one, a 0.1 watt versus 100 watts. So um, they kind of cancel out and we get about a factor of 100 um, improvement in energy efficiency from the cell phone processor relative to the server processor. But these cell phone processors are also a lot smaller. So you can use a whole bunch of them in the same amount of area um, and therefore get better aggregate performance. Now, you know, graphics processors are using this idea, really simple, tiny processors. Um, and uh, um, embedded processors also, you know, you can argue about exactly what these numbers are, but give you maybe even a little bit more performance, um, uh, more, more in terms of energy efficiency. But you're, whatever we're going to do, we're going to have lots of chips that are going to have thousands of cores on them if we're ever going to build an exascale machine. And Part of what comes up from this is heterogeneous computing. So this is one of the challenges we're worried about. And by the way, going back to that, that electricity argument, it doesn't really matter if you want to run an exaflop application or the Department of Energy wants to install 100 10 petaflop computers all over the complex, it still has to worry about the fact that it's a $100 million electricity bill that they're going to be paying overall. So it's really not just about the scale of machine. And this is quite different than what we were worrying about in getting to petascale, where we're worried about making bigger machines. Now we're worried about how do we get the power per node of computing down um, and also still have a scalable architecture that you could run large-scale applications on. So 
the case for heterogeneity says, well, in the previous slide I told you you have to have really small energy efficient cores. Um, and so this says, but maybe you need a few kind of standard fat CPUs for running the operating system and maybe because some parts of the code don't run very well in those little cores. Um, and so then maybe the other thing that people often equate, although really doesn't have anything to do with heterogeneity, but they'll say, oh, locally managed memory is another important benefit um, or, or way of saving energy. So rather than having caches of the kind that you fought with in homework one to try to get your matrix multiplied to use the cache in exactly the right way, we say, well, just put some fast memory on the chip and it'll be your job as a programmer to load the data in and out of that memory so we load exactly what you want um, now. The advantage is you have complete control. The disadvantage is you have complete control, so you have to um, rewrite your software and make it manage that level of the memory hierarchy. We can split the memory between the CPU and add an accelerator. That's what some people mean by heterogeneous. I think that's a nightmare, and I hope it's going away. I think it is going away, but right now, a machine like Titan at Oak Ridge has a CPU and a GPU. Um, the machine at TAC has a CPU and an Intel uh, uh, Phi, process Phi processor. Um, a Knights, whatever one it is, um, and uh, Corner maybe I think on that one, and uh, then there's a then there's also the, uh, another thing is the coprocessor interface between the CPU and the accelerator. So what does that mean? That the code mostly runs in the CPU. So if you've programmed a GPU, um, you know that you know your your application runs in the CPU, even if you're just running on one node. And if you want to do some GPU stuff, you say, oh, send some data over there and kind of you know call the GPU and tell it to do some work for me. This is the wrong way. I think if you're going to make good use of an exascale machine, what you want to do is to put the minority, um, the, sorry, the majority, you know, uh, lightweight cores in charge, and say the, C the GPUs run everything. And then every once in a while, if there's something you can't do on the GPU, because for example, you need to do a kernel call that's not supported on this NVIDIA processor, then you go off and call one of the CPUs. And that, by the way, happens all uh, to already today to a certain extent inside of Hopper and inside of Edison, because there's I.O. nodes in that network that have different processors in them than the compute nodes that you're mostly running on. So when you do an I.O. operation, that'll actually go off and run on one of these um, somewhat different I.O. nodes. And, uh, so or I'm hoping that, I'm, you know, what we're worried about is that people say, oh, well, this is what machines look like today. They're these accelerators. They have this coprocessor interface. We have to design all of our software around them. Instead, we'd like to think about what, what do we need? Well, we certainly need lightweight cores. They may need to be heterogeneous, but we don't need that other stuff. Okay, so that means that we have to... Um, we have to rewrite our software to take advantage of what those kind of processors will look like. I, I'm afraid that compilers are not going to completely take advantage of it for you. I'm sure that Jim has talked about um, the speed of memory, but of course, even, um, even though it's been hard to get processors to scale, the problem of getting memory to scale in terms of both capacity and, more importantly, in terms of bandwidth and latency um, is, has been even harder. So you know, there's the evolution of memory density, um, and uh, it's, uh, it, it has actually, um, it was, going up at 4x per, for every three years for a while and then kind of leveled off to, or slowed down to 2x every three years, so not keeping the pace with logic density. And, um, and the cost of computing is dropping much faster than the um, cost of memory. So all of these things, and I know you've seen this, this chart before, so I won't really talk about it except to say um, what we have to worry about in these exascale machines is also the fact that everything you do to move data around in them, both between processors and between the processor and the memory system, will be more expensive. So, and those are, this is hard to change, right? Because latency, which is the, t the delay it takes, is really fundamentally going to be limited by physics. And if you build an exaflop system out, to, out of today's technology, it would be huge, and the latency across that machine, uh, which would be multiple machine rooms in today's technology, would be, um, would be quite noticeable. Uh, today we also lose a lot in uh, software overhead, which isn't really not a physics limitation, it's a software limitation. But anyway, and bandwidth is really about how much money you can afford. Um, but even if you put all of your money into your network, you still probably couldn't get as much, or 90% of your money in the network, you still couldn't get um, the balance that you would want because that bandwidth is very expensive relative to the processor. By the way, expensive both in power and in uh, cost. So. I like to think of this as the memory swamp rather than the memory wall um, because you know, people will say, oh, what happened to that memory wall? Didn't we slam into that thing a while ago? Um, and, uh, but you know, we didn't, and this wasn't something that came up because of multi-core, but because we put, started putting multiple cores on the chip, we kept walking further into the swamp because we allowed more and more aggregate performance on a processor chip even though the individual cores were not going much faster. Now, there are things that people are looking at in the technology space, so things like stacked uh, memory, 
um, and uh, even looking again at um, integrated processor and memory technologies, things like that, uh, putting processors in all different parts of the, the storage system to get, to get the co computing closer to the storage. Um, and, uh, but the, um, these are still, there's still, still things that we're looking at that, that, that the uh, vendors and so on are looking at. And I think, though, fundamentally, though, the, the cost of data movement is still going to be more expensive than doing com computing. So um, what are we doing about this in terms of um, trying to build exascale systems that will actually be useful for science? And the theme within the Department of Energy is co-design. And the idea of co-design is to um, really understand what the scientific applications need and then try to communicate that to the vendors in a way that makes sense to them. Many years ago, actually before I was even involved um, at NERSC, I went to a meeting with them where there was a hardware designer from um, IBM there and um, I explained the innermost loop of uh, sparse matrix vector multiply, basically a sparse dot product, to try to explain why um, caches weren't necessarily working very well for us in, in that context, that we were accessing an individual word of memory, not using the whole cache line, really limited by the memory bandwidth um, speed, but, but even the random access speed of the memory system. So that's kind of the kind of a version of co-design is trying to extract from the applications what are the critical points that are limiting us on, on current um, architectures and will limit us even more in the future, and then trying to figure out how to, um, how, how to uh, if, if there's anything that can be done with them. Now, it's a, it's a two-way street, because what it turns out the vendors do is they say, well, that's very interesting, but by the way, we can't give you any more bandwidth for the amount of money that you're willing to put into bandwidth, or even, you know, even if you're put, willing to put 90% of your, your um, budget into bandwidth, it doesn't really make sense to, to do that, because you can, for some of your other applications, you get so much more benefit by putting a little bit more computing. And so, um, so there's you know, a dialogue that has to happen. There was a project at NERSC um, that uh, Dave D'Onofrio, who's here in this picture, ran with um, John Schalf, was the lead on that, looking at co-design in a project called Green Flash. Um, and this was um, the idea of figuring out what a future climate model would look like. So there's a little mesh, um, which is an icosahedral mesh, um, used to map around the globe. And to take that computation, um, that, that particular algorithm and the method was um, developed by the group at, I think, uh, University of Colorado, if I got, got that right, um, and uh, uh, map that onto a future architecture. And so what do you do to get a future architecture? Well, they built an emulator using technology here at the, on the campus, um, the kind of a, these um, using FPGAs, so reconfigurable hardware. Um, from something like the, uh, the RAW project, and this was built with these, uh, these Tensilica processors, um, which were these FPGAs running at um, just at 25 megahertz, so not at anything close to sort of peak speeds of current um, ASIC pro you know, standard um, processors. But you can then run, it's fast enough that you can actually run a piece of this full application on this computation and figure out, I mean, you can vary parameters of the architecture and figure out what's, what's going to happen. So um, within this project and related to the, the piece of it that's done by um, Krista Sonovich and John Warsnick or, um, on campus was, um, at least at the time, looking at something called um, ISIS, which was a DOE-funded piece of the project um, where they were building these FPGA boards and then built this thing called the, tool, the Chisel tool, tool Chain, which they're still working on now. Um, and that is um, based on this, this Scala language as a way of specifying what the hardware should look like uh, and making it e easy to get a compiler, the tools, um, and the layout and everything um, out of the system. So this really allows you to do architectural research. And so you can see that um, what you get out of this model is it's much faster than running a software simulator for a future architecture. So you have the ability to actually run little applications or even more scaled up versions of, of full complex applications and because you can get an, an actual compiler out you don't have to be writing everything in machine code and things like that so you really get um, the ability to experiment with these these kinds of systems um, this these were some results from um, John Schalf and one of his uh, maybe two of his postdocs um, Didam Unat and um, Sai Chan looking at a particular computation that comes up in combustion it's, a, uh, it's a, a computation on a structured grid, um, but this was looking at what hardware features could you put in and what impact would it have on the computation. The species have to do what means um, the amount of chemistry in the code, the number of different chemicals, chemical um, 
species that are in the, in the computation. So you can, each one of these lines you can think of from our standpoint as being independent. And um, the interesting thing about this was, you know, how much do you get by adding more memory bandwidth? Well, that's a pretty substantial increase. But um, the other thing that came up uh, was, uh, so your fast exponentiation was actually really important to the performance of this particular computation. Um, but the other overall conclusion was that um, if you just added the hardware and you didn't add the software techniques to optimize for that feature of the hardware, you didn't really get the benefits of a lot of the, the hardware improvements. So you had to do both of them together. So um, the kind of challenges that come up in, um, uh, in, these, these in, in Exascale, um, you know, I'll just summarize here. And I haven't really talked about every one of them, but we'll probably um, I'll leave a little time for question. And, um, and then I do have to take off in a few minutes anyway. But these, the, just to summarize, power is really the primary co constraint um, that we're looking at in these designs. And that's quite different than computer design over the last couple of decades where we were primarily, the designers were primarily interested in power, I mean in performance. Performance was the goal that they were trying to get toward. And that's because although on your laptop you worry a little bit about battery life, um, on something like a desktop machine that was that's plugged into the wall or a server that's in your server room, for the most part you didn't worry that much about the power. But um, the real issue is for most people who aren't building supercomputing centers or data centers like Google and Amazon and so on, is not the price of the electricity, it's the fact that there's too much heat density in the, um, in the processors and so, so you can't actually build them. So power really becomes the, is the, the primary design constraint and the question is how do you get more performance without adding a lot more power and power density density into your chips. So you get that through parallelism. Um, you can kind of go through the physics equations to see this, but you can uh, lower the clock rate, which lowers the power consumption, and then add more processors. And overall, you save, um, you get lower power uh, usage out of that than if you uh, try to run everything at a higher clock rate, because there's a nonlinear effect um, when you try to increase the clock rate. You, um, as a result, the processor architecture changes. And that means that the way that you're going to program them, this machines um, potentially changes. We're very worried right now about things like um, um, how uh, you know GPUs and how to how to move scientific applications over onto that code. Um, the memory growth, as I said, is not keeping up before. So this changes the way we, we program things and the algorithms that you write, which you've heard about from Jim. Uh, I.O. performance is not keeping up, which I haven't really said very much about, but I, I will mention something about that in the next, next NERSE system. And, um, and resilience is a big problem, which I also haven't talked about um, very much. But we're really concerned. And one of the, one of the arguments is because of the scale of machine, uh, resilience becomes a bigger problem. Um, although that really scales with the number of chips and the number of connections in the system more than it does the number of cores in the system. The other problem, though, is as you try to optimize for power, you may lower the thresh, what's called the threshold voltage um, in order to save power. And that makes your logic uh, you know, kind of naively. It sort of makes a 1 and a 0 not look so very different. And so you can have certain kinds of failures that come up for that reason. Um, and then the last one is about, you know, once you scale up your big machine with lots of parallelism, you need to have a lot of interconnect uh, bisection bandwidth. But if you look at this list of, of all the problems, most of these are really happening within the node level. So it's really independent of whether you're running a petascale application on a petaflop machine, an exascale application on an exaflop machine, or want to run a more mo modest size problem on, let's say, you know, one rack or something like that of a, of a supercomputer or even your own cluster, um, because it's really um, really about how to, how to deal with the data movement, the parallelism issues, and the power issues um, within the building blocks of that future exascale machine. So um, I, I wanted to just say one more thing here, which is, uh, I think, what does this mean for NERSC? So, um, so at NERSC, how are we dealing with these kinds of challenges? Um, so one of the things that we've looked at in NERSC, let me just make sure I have my graphs in here. You've seen that one. OK, there we go. So one of the things that we looked at in NERSC is um, how much computing do the scientists need? And we do a lot of analysis of the kind of application workload. We meet with um, each of the application communities once every uh, couple of few years and um, have a two-day workshop where we really uh, understand what their algorithms look like, what their computational requirements are. Um, and from that, that those um, workshops, um, we developed a uh, projection of how much computing they needed. So what they said from those requirement workshops is these black um, X's right here would be um, what they would need in terms of the computing performance. And uh, this NERS 6 plus NERS 7, NERS 6 is Hopper, NERS 7 is Edison. So this is where we're at right now. 
we fell off this curve and we're, you know, um, we're not back on the, in either the traditional uh, growth curve, which is that blue line, um, nor are we keeping up with what they're saying they're using, which is even higher than the traditional growth path. Um, for NERSC-8, which is a system that will be coming in in 2016, um, there's a question about how big the budget is, and so we can either at least get back on the blue line, uh, the traditional growth path, or not. Um, I would say the answer right now is probably not. We'll be down here. Um, and as I said, the, the requirements reviews say there's an even bigger growth. So what is NERSC strategy, though, for dealing with all of these changes that are coming from Exascale? And actually, this started when I was still NERSC director um, a couple of years ago. And uh, we made a decision that uh, we buy a machine about every three years. Uh, we try to run machi two machines at a time on the floor. So basically, the last year, there's a year where you're only running one machine because you're turning one of them off and decommissioning it and bringing in another machine and getting it up to speed. But you're always running one of those um, in steady, and, and often you're running two of them in steady state. Um, so we were running at the time, uh, we, had, we had just installed NERS 6, and the question is what were we going to do about NERS 7? And so we were looking around at GPUs, and other people were starting to install GPUs, and we made a decision that NERS 7, we would be very conservative. NERS 7 Edison is um, what uh, David Keyes likes to call the supercomputer that anybody will love. Um, it is very easy to program. I don't know if you will agree, but uh, compared to, say, a GPU cluster, it's really easy to program. It has pretty high network bandwidth and memory bandwidth, fast processors relative, you know, in terms of what you can buy today with the Intel Ivy Bridge processors. So it's a really easy uh, system for the NERSC users to love. It's not putting us on an exascale path because those are fairly power hungry processors, um, you know, power hungry everything in the system. So uh, how are we ever going to get on, we, so we'll never get, stay on this growth curve um, if, we, if we're going to use those kinds of um, systems. So the decision was NERSC 7 will be a traditional kind of architecture. NERSC 8, we've got 5,000 users. NERSC 8, we're, we started warning them, is going to be a more energy efficient architecture. So for over a year now, probably even two years, we've been telling them, beware, when NERSC 8 comes, it's going to be a um, it's going to be an energy efficient architecture. We wouldn't tell them exactly what it is because it was a procurement. Um, so we just announced Cori, um, which is the uh, named after the first um, female uh, American uh, Nobel laureate, um, Cori, who and uh, um, who and it's going to be deployed in 2016. So it'll be 50 cabinets of what's called a Cray XC system. It will have the Knight's Landing processor in it. So that's the Intel Mic uh, processor. And, uh, but it is a self-hosted version of Mike, meaning that it actually will not be heterogeneous. It'll be a homogeneous um, set of mic processors on each node and no separate kind of CPUs. But the, the mic processors are x86, x86 kind of architecturally compatible. Um, so we're hoping to program it with a mixture of MPI with OpenMP. Um, there will be uh, 64 to 120 gigabytes of memory per node. Um, you can see some of the other specs. The network is the same network that's in the uh, uh, Edison system. It seems like there's a little more headroom in that network, so we, there's probably one more generation of machine in there. It will have 10 times the um, what's called the application performance of Hopper. So the way we buy machines at NERSC is never for things like the peak performance. Um, instead, we buy them based on application performance. And there's about half a dozen application benchmarks. And we tell the vendors they have to, to commit to a certain application performance number. And what they've committed to is 10 times the uh, Hopper, Hopper system. And uh, there's a file system, and then uh, uh, this thing called a burst buffer, which is the last thing I'll mention here, because it kind of wraps back around to the data intensive problems. And actually, one of the people who's most interested in this is Peter Nugent, who's doing the cosmology work that I mentioned earlier. So what is this thing called a burst buffer? Well, really, really gross in terms of orders of magnitude. Um, there's about two orders of magnitude difference between the cost of accessing um, data that's in main memory and DRAM and going out to disk. So um, that gap is awfully big. And in fact, um, we did this procurement with another lab, with Los Alamos National Labs. And they were, in particular, very worried about resilience in this time frame. Um, and resilience is already an issue that I think you probably don't talk about too much in this class. But in real large applications today, you write what's called checkpoint restart code, where every once in a while, you dump the state of your application onto disk. Um, and then you complete, continue running. And if anything fails, um, you can always recover that intermediate state from disk. 
And so, for example, the big climate models do this, and they really optimize for how frequently do I have to save it to, uh, depending on how, free, how much the machine stays up. Um, and what you really want is a machine in which you can make forward progress. Right? If your failure rate is too high, um, you spend all your time checkpointing and never, never make any forward progress. But um, Edison and Hopper are, are good machines that way. But what, what um, Los Alamos wanted to put in was something they called a burst buffer, um, which is NVRAM in between the DRAM and the disk. And so this is kind of an order of magnitude in between, so about an order of magnitude faster. Uh, non-volatile RAM, yeah, non-volatile memory. Um, so it is still, it, it still is, preserves its state, um, even if it's not being uh, um, actively powered. So it's non-volatile, um, kind of like a disk, but, and it's much faster, well, in certain ways than, than um, disk. And uh, so we've done some, uh, um, but we're, we're trying to figure out for NERSC, we're a little bit less concerned about the time to checkpoint because we run smaller jobs on our system than Los Alamos does. Um, but we are, um, you know, we have to figure out um, how, to, how to take advantage of this and whether we can take advantage of this in application. So what we're looking at is some of the data intensive workloads. I don't think I have the uh, right text on the bottom of this to describe this. But in things like the cosmology workflow, what we're looking at is um, how you do the, um, uh, how you can stage the data um, on this, this faster kind of intermediate storage so that you can make your a much bigger computation run um, on this kind of machine. So that's one of the other things we'll be looking at in the NERSC time frame in addition to uh, figuring out how to program these microprocessors and hopefully you'll all still be using NERSC at that point and uh, can come, as I said, we'll, I'm sure we'll have lots of classes and things like that to help get the NERSC users started. So with that, I will end. I just wanted to give you a little idea of what's um, actually happening in the ground at NERSC and see if there are any questions.